So, so it is my great pleasure to introduce the next speaker, <coughs> Professor Minyon Kim from the University of Oxford. <coughs> After his getting PhD at the Yale University, um, he successfully uh, got the uh, position of professors uh, at the University of Arizona and uh, Purdue University and then uh, University College London and and now the University of Oxford. And he's uh, um, one of the leading researchers in the area of arithmetic algebraic geometry. And uh, <coughs> among the other things, um, his most famous uh, work so far is uh, his brand new approach to, to, to various problems in, in diophantine geometry uh, by using uh, the theory of arithmetic fundamental groups in the PLE context. And uh, here, I'm happy to, to, to tell you that uh, part of this work is, uh, was done during his stay in Kyoto uh, as a visiting professor at RIMS. Now, uh, <coughs> today's title is Responsive Laws, Diophantine Equations, and Fundamental Groups. Thank you very much. Is this working OK? I see. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation to come here. It's uh, wonderful to visit Kyoto, which is always a great source of ideas. Professor Tamaga already mentioned that much of the work I d I'm describing today was done here. And then I ran out of ideas for many years because of not coming to Kyoto. <laughs> I'm trying to get some more even during this short visit. Uh, I was told that this should be something like a colloquium lecture for uh, non-experts, including non-number theorists, and I hope I've, uh, I've put in some, of it, some effort to make it like this. And um, in particular, I wasn't sure. Uh, so, OK, so there are many objects mentioned in the title here. But I wasn't sure how to express what the main point is. What is it I'm trying to study? Because I don't know most of the time what I'm trying to study with these things. But uh, uh, for the, uh, the sake of the lecture today, I thought I'd focus on the case of what I might call arithmetic fields, fields of an arithmetic nature, which again, we can use in a very vague way. But whatever one might mean in general, in any case, you're always going to mean things like the fields of rational numbers <coughs> right? or fields of algebraic number fields, which are finite field extensions of the rational one might mean other things as well, for example, finitely generated fields. But for now, I'll focus on this case. And I'll say I, uh, what I'm going to describe in today's lecture is just some, roughly speaking, digressions surrounding the study of arithmetic fields of this sort. Now, algebraic number fields, if we're being very concrete about it, we can view them as just a vector space q to the d with some nice multiplicative structures. So these are finite field extensions of q. So for example, here are some examples, classical examples, as well as that last one down there. That's actually a very interesting field for reasons known only to number theorists. <laughs> so, or you can have higher dimensional examples like this. So roughly speaking, these are the arithmetic fields that I'm talking about today. So about these, we'll pose, I want to pose so oh, just one brief question, namely the problem of how to classify such things. And I'm, not, I'm going to say almost nothing about actual classification, but just mention that this problem of classification is somewhere in the background as motivating a kind of even very concrete investigations that we'd like to do. And I guess uh, one general remark is that this classification is very hard and very little is known. But you could also ask uh, why we should classify such things. <laughs> and uh, I, so I, uh, I, said, uh, I guess what I wanted to say is state that the classification problem is there as an inspiration for a lot of mathematics. But the question of why we should classify is also there. And I'm not going to give any kind of an answer to that either, because the answer is too long. Um, uh, I think there is an answer, but I certainly can't say it in any coherent way that would fit into a lecture. But I'll mention that this question of why is always also in the background together with the problem of classification. 
Nevertheless, even though the problem of classification is in some sense wide open, I'll mention that there are some related results of this sort. Right? I'm just mentioning names here without even telling you what the results are. So for example, D here refers to the degree of the field extension, that is the, that is the dimension as the rational vector space. And I think it was Gauss that classified quadratic fields as well, right? I'm always confused by this. Fields of dimension 2, degree 2, I think was classified by Gauss. Then, after more than 100 years, Davenport and Heilbronn had this theorem for degree 3 fields, and then several decades after that, recently Manjur Vagava, in some sense, classified fields of degree 4 and 5. But here, these classification theorem, I just mentioned this, just to say that these results really are not of the right sort. <laughs> in many different senses, but in particular, if you, go, if you look at this, results for degree 3 and degree 4 and 5, they don't even come anywhere near to actually classify. But all they do is they count number of fields of a given discriminant, for example, <coughs> in an asymptotic fashion. And I, as I said, I'm not going to even state the results, but I will mention that these great theorems, like Vargava theorems in recent decades, they are only scratching the surface of classification, indicating how difficult these kind of problems are. And there are other senses in which these are really not the kind of classification theorem of the sort that I'm interested in myself. So instead, I'll move on to a brief description of the classification of the sort that I'm trying to understand myself, and I think other people here are also trying to understand. So in order to do that, I'll, I'm taking a mildly historical approach without being anything like a historian myself. And I'll mention that maybe the first uh, uh, results classification theorems of the right sort are, are what constitute Galois theory. And we all know what this is, but I'll just remind you anyways. So I used to think that putting pictures into lectures was a bit of a distraction. But lately, I've been feeling like for colloquium lectures, it's kind of nice to get the historical perspective by seeing what the people look like. I put some pictures into these lectures. Into this lecture. So that's Galois. So what does Galois theory do from the point of view of classification? What it actually does is something like this. It, let's see, I guess this is the point. It assumes that you want, there's a field that you already understand field extension that you under, already understand. <coughs> and we also put some condition on it, like that the field extension is Galois, meaning what? That it has a lot of, uh, the maximum number of automorphisms. Yeah. If there are as many automorphisms as this dimension, it's, easy, uh, it's a sort of elementary field theory to see that there can't be more automorphisms than the dimension. If it actually has that maximum number, we say it's Galois. So what we do in Galois theory, we assume that a field of this sort is given, then the main theorem classifies the subfields of F. So that's what it is. So it's a great theorem, but there's a way in which it's unsatisfactory. Why? Because it's kind of a top-down classification. You, know, you assume that some big F is given, right? and it says, well, subgroups of the Galois groups correspond to sub extensions. Right, but nevertheless, of course, the theorem was a big advance. And that's the first classification theorem of the right sort that I in the sense that I was describing earlier. Uh, it, um, it, was, it was still unsatisfactory as it is. Now, the second part of this more or less historical progression of the right, class field theory. You know, and this is a photograph of Takagi, who was one of the founders of class field theory. And another founder was Emil Artin. Together, we refer to class field theory as often the Artin Takagi class field theory. Or should it be Takagi Artin class field theory? Anyways, so what did they do in their work? So, this was a bottom up classification, or it's, it's an attempt to give a bottom up classification. Meaning what? Here, you start with f. So f, for example, f could be q itself. Okay? And then you make some attempt to see what kind of case can be built out of f further. So in this sense, it's much more of a constructive approach than assuming something's given at the bottom top and then 
and then try to see what lies under it. So here you start from the bottom and you try to build up. Um, uh, uh, here, uh, uh, furthermore, the idea generally in class field theory is that these k's that lie above f should be classified in terms intrinsically in terms of f in some suitable sense. So here, I'll, I'll go back to this picture. So if you're given f, you're trying to classify the possible k's that lie above f, and somehow you should be able to describe the possibilities intrinsically in terms of f. And this is the idea, the program of class field theory. In many ways. Now, what we mean by intrinsically, as many other things I'm saying right now, one can meet, take, take in a very vague sense. So, you shouldn't be too rigid about <laughs> what you mean here by intrinsically. Nevertheless, there is a guiding principle, namely that the motivation actually does. A lot of the motivation for what this intrinsically might mean does come from topology. Namely, the situation where if you have a connected space, for example, then the coverings of X can be classified by finite, finite cover, coverings, for example, can be classified by finite index subgroups of the topological fundamental group of X. And this, of course, in some sense is an intrinsic invariant of X that in a lot of cases, for example, if you're given a CW complex or something, you can compute this using combinatorial data. So in that sense, this kind of intrinsic invariant in topology allows us to classify the covering space of things that lie above X. And class field theory also attempts to do something similar by trying to find an arithmetic substitute for this kind of thing. So what does the artin takagi theorem uh, theory do? In particular, so uh, <laughs> by the way, I often make mistakes when I state theorems of class field theory. So but fortunately, there are many experts in the audience to correct me. <laughs> but so Takagi, in particular, defined an actual profinite topological group. So here, this limit means that it's an inverse limit. It's a system of elements inside finite groups. So turning this into a profinite topological group. And he defined a topological group that actually does something very similar to, the, to what the fundamental group does. Namely, the open subgroups of this topological group end up to be being in correspondence with the finite extensions of F, except they're the finite abelian extensions. This was the limitation of the theory here, uh, comparing to topology. You don't get all extensions, but just the finite abelian extensions. So it is possible to have a substitute for the topological fundamental group, except it's not quite a substitute, because you can only build up finite abelian. Martin carried this a little bit further. So I, I, for years, I was puzzled about what the role of the two different people were. And I think the way I formulated it here is correct. Takagi wrote down this topological group whose open subgroups correspond to finite equation. <coughs> then Martin actually proved that there is a canonical isomorphism from this group. So what is this thing here? You take the al an algebraic closure of F and take the Galois group, all the automorphisms of that field, that fix F, and take the abelianization. So this is the abelian Galois group of F, absolute abelian Galois group of F. And Artin defined an isomorphism between this topological group and this abelianized Galois group. So this was called the Artin reciprocity. So together, this constitutes the class field theory in the sense of Artin and Takagi. Right. So uh, to re repeat what I said already, so in some sense, whatever these things are, actually, sorry, maybe I'll give just two examples first. So for example, if F is Q, then <laughs> these levels of the group that appear in the inverse system are just the invertible elements in set mod M. So this subgroup, uh, group of invertible elements inside this ring set mod M. And if F happens to be a field like Q with the square root of I, minus one or joint, then the level look like this. Take inverse limit of these things. So there, again, I hope that even this picture indicates you some sense in which these groups can be built intrinsically out of the field. This is the flavor of the class field theory in all situations. Nevertheless, as I said already, and as people have been struggling with for a long time, uh, we can't really seem to give 
a similar description with the abelian removed. We want to put it by the whole color group. We can't quite do it as yet, and it's a very active area of research. In different forms, this might be what's called, but in different forms, people call this non abelian fastidious area. Hence, to replicate this picture or generalize the Tintakagi picture to get the whole Galois group, or at least some large non abelian portions of them that go beyond the abelian. The most famous case of this is probably what's called the Langlands program. In the Langlands program, you try to address this problem of describing this growth by, by linearizing the problem. That is to say, instead of looking at the group itself, you try to classify the representations of the group. And the representations of this group are supposed to be classified uh, in terms of something called automorphic forms of that. Special functions on complex domains that are somehow canonically built out of that to give you a classification of the linear representations of the color group. And that's one version of non abelian that people, that, 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 that uh, is really one of the most active areas of Compressier in the present day. Thomas, here's a picture of Langlands. <laughs> Relatively recent picture. Yeah, but uh, now I'm not going to say anything about non-abelian class field theory in this sense, even though it does still inspire a good deal of what I think about and pretty much what all number theories are somehow affected by this <laughs> program in some form or another. Nevertheless, today I'm not going to say anything about, uh, about it for lack of competence among other things. Instead, we're going to, I'm going to continue this somewhat semi-historical survey with a little bit of a digression that moves away from number fields for a second, and instead mentions these non-Archimedean fields that somehow intrude upon our study of these arithmetic fields. They're not strictly arithmetic fields in the sense that we normally think about it. They're not like Q or number fields or finitely generated fields, but they arise in a natural way when trying to study arithmetic fields. And here's a picture of Kurt Hunzel who I guess is the first person to study these kind of things. So here's a picture. <laughs> so you take, normally this is the way one thinks about it, you take the rational numbers and um, we, uh, if you study mathematics in the usual fashion, the rational numbers form will become a subfield of the real number. But then it turns out that you can put it into other complete fields, the two adding numbers, the three adding numbers, the five adding numbers, and so forth. And so you view as some Q as lying at the intersection of all these different complete, complete fields. And this one is Archimedean, and all the rest are non Archimedean. You can do something very similar for algebraic number fields as well, put them into various completions, and form a picture very similar to this. To the So there are many things in number theory that you do with these different completions. But uh, the aspect that I'm going to mention first of all is this relation to class field theory. Uh, uh, this seems to be due to Hasse, this, this connection between non archimedian fields and class field theory. Hasse did many things with these non archimedian fields, but uh, among them is this <coughs> class field theory. So what did he do? What he did was he took one of these non Archimedean fields right, and took the group of non zero elements inside the field. Right, and then he connected it to Galois field. So this is the so called local reciprocity map that takes the non zero elements inside one of these complete fields and puts it to define an injective homomorphism, which is essentially canonical. There's a little choice of normalization that's involved in the definition. It's essentially canonical. Canonically, you can put it into the Galois group of this field FV itself, again, abelianized. Once you abelianize it, this is called the ro local reciprocity map that belongs to the local class field theory. Um, but these Galois groups, in fact, 
all sit inside, you can put them inside the Galois group of the number field F. Remember, uh, uh, to, to restate, we're actually interested in these algebraic number fields, right? We've completed it to one of these non-Archimedean fields. The, the non-zero elements, the multiplicative group of the non-Archimedean non field, maps into, of this complete field, maps into an abelian Galois group of that field itself. But by embedding F bar into F V bar, you can also get an inclusion of Galois groups of this sort. So what ends up happening is that all these non-Archimedean fields actually come together inside this big Galois group here. And this is a very significant picture, I think, from many points of view. That's worth emphasizing. So here's a picture for the case of Q. So here you have the absolute color of group of Q, a billionized. But then all these different non-Archimedean fields they come together inside this big group. Which, uh, the reason I'm emphasizing this, especially for young students, is that when you first study these completions of the rational numbers, sometimes you're given the impression that they all form different, completely different universes that have nothing to do with each other. Yeah? And they only intersect in the rationals or algebraic numbers or something like that. And that's true from a certain point of view. But from the point of view of class field theory, that's not true at all. They all come together inside this Galois group and, also, and help us to understand this group. And they interact in complicated ways inside this group. And that's part of the reason why they are natural in some sense from the point of view of studying arithmetic theory. This group is very natural as, as these are the symmetry groups of these arithmetic fields. And then it, it, it somehow naturally contains all the other complete fields, which also explains the profinite nature of their topology because this is a So this picture deserves much more emphasis when we are studying number, algebraic number theory compared to the picture where these are all separate. Um, I'll also mention that these maps can all be put together. So here I've already once, once again this changed the context to the case of a general case. They can all be put together to define something called an idyllic reciprocity map. I guess I should have mentioned this first. But, uh, uh, so this is essentially a product of all these guys. So these idyls are a product of all these non-Archimedean fields for F, for the completion there. And then all these local reciprocity maps can be put together to form take a product of all these things and get an idyllic global reciprocity map that ends up inside this abelianized Galois group. And all of this, so up to here was done by Hasse, that this idyllic reciprocity map you know, seems to have been first defined by Chevalet. Here's a puzzle. Who are these two gentlemen back here? Anybody know? Sorry? Do you know? I, I know, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, nobody knows? One of them was in Kyoto, for sure. Akizuki. Right? Akizuki, that's right. The gentleman on the left is Akizuki. <laughs> and the gentleman on the right, I don't know him. Well, I guess his name was. Uh, suddenly the name is escaped me. Kobori, Kobori maybe? Kob Somebody like that. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know exactly where they took this photo. <laughs> Akizuki was definitely here in Kyoto, I think. Okay. Anyways, so this uh, idyllic reciprocity map was yet another version of cross field theory. Right. Now, but if I go back, if we continue this discussion of non-Archimedean fields, it's of course well known that uh, another way, way in which it arises, and maybe it first arose in the work of Hasse as well, was in the study of Diophantine <coughs> equation, not in the study of Galois group <coughs> per se. Although all the connection comes up very quickly, but nevertheless, it probably arose first in the study of equations. So what do I mean by that? So for example, <laughs> the square root of minus 1, which doesn't lie inside the reals, lie inside all these other completions. So x squared plus 1 equals 0 can be solved inside these other fields, although they can't be solved inside the reals. 
So this is the general statement. This is the square root of minus 1 is inside to p for all p congruent to one mod 4, for example. So this is the kind of equation solving you can do with these non archimedean computations. And this already this statement already tells you that they must contain some kind of insight about solving equations that's not accessible in the real. The reason, uh, from an arithmetic viewpoint, that these are very useful is because this QP, in a sense, forms a bridge between solutions inside finite rings of this sort and solutions in Q. So this is the picture. So you can put Q inside one of these completions. But inside here, there's a subring of those things. If you take the metric point of view, this is the subring of elements that have absolute value less than or equal to 1. But then these have all these finite quotient rings. That must be there. For example, FP. So you can take solutions inside these finite rings, which are much easier to analyze than solutions in Q. You consider, say, sometimes lift those solutions to ZP, then that gives you solutions in QP. That somehow are supposed to come together to give you insight and solutions in Q. So this is more or less the way in which we usually introduce these non Archimedean fields in undergraduate and number theory via this question of solving equation through, I mean, in connection with this question of solving equation. Here, for example, is one of the uh, uh, most, uh, uh, the first deep theorem <laughs> regarding these completions. It's sometimes called the Hassan minkowski theorem. I didn't prepare a picture of Minkowski. Uh, but what it says, that for equations of this sort, so this seems like a very simple equation, but still it's quite a deep theorem in its own way, this theorem, that if you take an equation like ax squared plus by squared equals c, and you want to solve it inside the number field f, then in fact, a solution exists inside the number field if and only if there's a solution inside all these completions. So that's actually quite an interesting <coughs> theorem, and I think, as I said, the first actually deep theorem concerning that applies these non archimedean fields. And this turns out to be a quite an effective theorem as well. So for example, I'll just state it in the case of Q. When f equals Q, and you want to know whether or not one of these equations has a solution, right? and you just need to check it for R, you just need to check if it has real solutions, and QP solutions for all P's dividing twice of ABC. Uh, it says for all v, but you don't actually need to check for all v. <laughs> Most of the v's turn out to be automatic. Okay? And it suffices to check it for a finite collection, and for example, for when f equals q, for reals and p addicts for p dividing these coefficients and p equals 2. And whether or not there's a solution inside these fields, there's again a straightforward criterion. So this is a um, uh, these things called Hilbert symbols. You don't have to know what they are, but they are readily computable given these A, B, C. Uh, they are plus or minus ones. Uh, plus ones or minus ones, all of them. Right? They can be easily computed uh, you're given these numbers A, B, C, so that you get a very effectively checkable criterion for whether or not this equation is a solution. So this is, as I said, one of the first deep theorems connecting non-Archimedean fields and number fields, also called global fields in this case. Now, this theorem has inspired a lot of number theory. In particular, people have attempted many different kinds of generalizations. <coughs> what kinds? Well, you could start with a rather general system of equations, a rather general variety defined over a number of fields, right? And then we're just expressing the fact that the f rational points, that the solutions inside your number field, can be embedded inside the product of solutions inside all these completions. So this, this is so, the so-called ring of Adel, which is essentially a product of all these fields. Okay? So given any f solution to the equation, you get a bunch of f v solutions simply because f lies inside all of these completions. Okay. Well, as a result, for example, if 
it doesn't have, if the, the equation doesn't have any adelic solution, for example, if it doesn't have FV solution for any given V, right, then of course it can't have any F solution. So this is the typical application, or easy application, so to speak, to say that an equation has no solutions inside Q because it doesn't have a solution inside R, or it doesn't have a solution inside the two addicts. So this is the, the, these are the easy applications that arise from these inclusions. But sometimes, as in the hassam minkowski theorem, the converse is also true. And these are, this requires considerably more number theory. That is to say, sometimes it happens that when this is non-empty, it also implies that the f-rational solutions, set of f-rational solutions, solution is non-empty. This doesn't happen too often, but this is exactly what happens in the case of this equation, ax squared plus by squared equals to that the non-emptiness of this, this, this set uh, uh, sometimes allows us to conclude the non-emptiness of the much smaller set. Whenever this happens for some class of variety, we say that the Hasse principle holds. This is called the Hasse principle. The statement for some class of equations that says if this is non-empty, the smaller set is also non-empty. But as I said, it's very rare. It's only for a, for a very special class of variety, a naive statement. Existence of some solutions inside say, R and QP for all QP implies the existence of rational solutions. Nevertheless, it's a fascinating enough phenomenon to have deserved. Well, but because it's such a rare phenomenon, what people have tried to do, many people, including me, <laughs> is we've tried to refine this subject. What kind of refinement am I referring to? Well, the general picture, remember, is still this. The F rational point of the variety always lie inside the adelic point, the product of the local points. So you could ask, well, Sometimes when this is non-empty, well, uh, if this is empty, this is, this is empty. That was the easy implication we stated. Rarely, when this is non-empty, this is also non-empty. But still, even in greater generality, we could ask whether or not we can locate the way these, these points, f-rational points, sit inside the adelic point. And that's a refined question you can ask that goes beyond the asset principle. Um, so even if you're, so even with the Hasse Minkowski theorem, by the way, when you teach it in an undergraduate course, even students always ask this question. They ask, but it's not the theorem isn't actually saying that any adelic point is actually a global point. It's just saying that if there is an adelic point, then there also is a global. point. It doesn't tell you which of the adelic points are global. Points. So you could ask this more refined question. Can we recognize this in some way? And when we ask the question in that form, the question generalizes to other equations as well. Why not? Maybe there are better theorems that allow us to recognize the existence of global points, even when the asset principle fails. OK, so with that question in mind, let's recall, we go back to this simple equation, ax squared plus by squared equals c. And I'll simplify further by assuming that there already is a rational point. We can generalize beyond this class with more work, but I'm not, I, in order to reduce technicalities, I'm going to just assume that there is a rational point and also that the points at infinity are rational, so there's some minor further technical conditions. So when you put all this together in a simple case, or that this factorizes, that's another way of putting it, then this, the variety defined by this equation just turns out to be the so-called multiplicative group in this case, so that the global points of this variety are just the, the non-zero elements inside F. And the same for the local points inside one of these completions. The points can be just identified with non-zero elements inside F. So this question of locating the global points inside the adelic points, yeah, sorry, I've inconsistently used stars somewhere and cross other places. They should all be the same. Anyway, the problem of locating the global points of this X, in this case, 
inside the adelic point. It's just a problem of locating the field inside the idel. That's what it becomes in this case. And in some sense, this problem has already been solved. Why? Well, this is where the so-called reciprocity law comes in. That is to say, remember, we had this idyllic reciprocity map defined by Chevalier that goes from idel to the abelian Galois group of the field. And there's, I didn't state it before, but the class field theory includes a so-called reciprocity law for this map which generalizes the Gauss reciprocity law and Hilbert reciprocity and all previous reciprocity laws that people cooked up in the 19th century. What it says is actually that this map from the Idels to the abelianized Galois group actually kills uh, the field sitting inside the Idels. This composed map is zero. So this kind of statement, when you formulate it correctly, as I said, it includes quadratic reciprocity and all the concrete reciprocity laws and the great generalization of it. But from our point of view, and then the point I'm stressing is that the reciprocity law itself, therefore, gives us a defining equation for the way the field sits inside the ideal. So this is a very simple observation, but for me, it took me a long time to appreciate this in some way. That, uh, somehow, you can write down, in some sense, an equation on the set of Videls whose zero set exactly contains the so-called principle equation. It will tell you how F star sits inside the Videls. It's not exact, although I used the word exact, but unfortunately, the kernel of the reciprocity law isn't exactly this, but it does give us a very strong constraint of the locus of the global points of the, of the multiplicative group inside the Adelic point. Except it's an equation that takes values in a group. So that's the interesting part of this story. That somehow, it's not an equation, or it's not a polynomial equation, or an analytic equation, or any other analytic sort, but it's an equation with values in a group. But subject to that generalization, it does, in some sense, give us something of a solution to the problem of identifying the global point. And this is what we'd like to generalize. <laughs> a kind of non-abelian reciprocity law of some sort. What sort? Well, I'd like to start with a rather general variety whose f rational points we'd like to understand, described in some way. And as usual, we would like to use this inclusion into the adelic point because, as indicated earlier, this is usually an easier set to understand. We're going to define so understand this as a subset of the adelic points, but because if, if, as you, as, as maybe I didn't state this so clearly before, the cost of studying this easier set is that it's harder to understand how this is inside it, but now what we'd like to do is define a reciprocity map to some more complicated target now, possibly, in such a way that the reciprocity map so this is a target. I'm not saying what kind of a target it is, but in any case, I wanted to have some base point so that the reciprocity map be, being equal to the, the inverse image of, of that base point becomes a defining equation for the global point, or a rather general point. So this would be uh, all of... Uh, uh, the defining equation would be satisfied, but not necessarily exactly. It's not necessarily exact, but there are, uh, depending on the variety, I do expect it to be exact as well. Yeah. But, in, but you're right that in general, of course, it won't be exact. So nevertheless, it should give us quite a bit of refined information about the way this system in all cases. Yeah, so I've been thinking about this kind of problem for quite a few years and made some progress. So, for the remaining time, I'd like to describe a little bit of the progress that's been made. So you notice the difference between the slides was that there was a question mark here, and the question mark has been removed now. <laughs> right. so this
describe a kind of non-abelian reciprocity law that works in a number of different situations. Except it's, it's inspired by, we're <laughs> going to use this theory of arithmetic fundamental groups. So this is where fundamental groups comes into the picture yet again. But in order to avoid technicalities, I'm not going to give you a precise definition of what is arithmetic fundamental group. I will just try to sketch the way in which they arise in reciprocity laws. And as I get to that, because the slides get a little bit more technical, maybe I'll start by showing you some more picture of the people that have inspired me in this research. Where, where, who's, who are the originators of the main ideas that go into this? So first, uh, first of all, this picture of Gordon Dick. <laughs> this picture is almost like something from a film, right? Uh, Gordon Dick, D sorry? I don't know. I, I, it's, it's, it looks fairly recent, of course, in the picture. This appears in that German website. I forgot what it was called. Sorry? Maybe somebody knows. Uh, some some Stiftung. <laughs> Um, but anyway, so Grundig, of course, defines these arithmetic fundamental groups. He set up the correct categorical framework that was necessary to, to generalize the theory of fundamental groups from topological spaces to more complicated topological spaces, so called Grundig topologies. And furthermore, so he did that in the 1960s, but then in the 1980s, in a series of mysterious publications, he also indicated how we should use the fundamental groups in diverse ways, including trying to use it to study solutions to equations. And then, of course, uh, another person, since I'm here in Kyoto, that I, I wanted to actually mention is uh, Professor Ihara. <laughs> He really pioneered a lot of the detailed study of arithmetic fundamental groups in the 1980s and 1990s, studying in particular, you know, coming up with many very interesting and deep formulas involving the action of Galois groups and fundamental groups. And these papers have been very influential in my own thinking as well. And then here is a picture of Professor Mutsuzuki, who is, of course, now developing a good deal of the theory of arithmetic fundamental groups. So I'll mention some of his specific influences towards the end of the lecture. And, uh, I can't not mention our host, Professor <laughs> Shinoda. <laughs> well, you see, the problem is that, as you know, Professor Tamago is a very modest man, so it's very hard to find um, pictures of him on the internet. Uh, uh, but after considerable searching, I, I found finally located. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that right? Yeah, I may have got that wrong as well. But this this birth year is correct. <laughs> but, but anyway, because he was disguised, it was quite hard to find. So anyway, so these are some of the people who really inspired my research in time non-abelian reciprocity laws. OK, so let me describe how this, uh, this law goes now. Um, and in order to make ideas concrete, I'm going to start with a smooth projective curve over a number field with genus at least two. Now, one doesn't have to do this. this these ideas work in far greater generality, in particular for affine curves, and even higher dimensional things as long as suitable assumption about the fundamental group, but nevertheless, I'm going to be uh, uh, set it up in a rather definite context today. And denote by delta uh, this uh, so-called profinite etal fundamental group of x considered as a variety over f bar with space point b. So I'll just give you a uh, uh, slightly dishonest description of what it is. What you can do is you can just take uh, the complex points of this variety, which will then be a complex manifold or Riemann surface, and then take the profinite completion of the topological fundamental group, the inverse limit of all the finite quotients of the topological fundamental group. But once you take this profinite completion, 
because of the fact that this variety itself and the base point were defined over f, it turns out <coughs> that this profinite completion has an action of the Galois group over the And for this, you need a different description of the group rather than via this topological one. Nevertheless, I'll cheat and just use this one. And a delta n denotes the lower central series of this group. Uh, so uh, superscript n will be the lower central series, and subscript n will be quotient modulo the lower central series. And T sub n denotes this successive quotient. So these will be then abelian groups. They are finally generated abelian, free of, uh, topologically finally generated. This is just notation. Now, uh, described a version of non abelian class field theory for X. So, what this does is, it, what the theory does, it takes the adelic points of A and puts on it a filtration. So, the, the in indexing is that the first subscript one refers to the whole thing that contains the subscript. The level two of the filtration is a subset. Level three is uh, the next subset, and so forth. Yeah. And then, from these things, it de we define a sequence of reciprocity maps. Now. From the nth level, it goes to a, 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 a set which actually is an abelian group, although the abelian group structure isn't that important. It's important to the set. But they're all different for each different n. get a different group for each. Ends. And they're defined in such a way that the n plus first level of this filtration is the kernel of the nth reciprocity. So I'll put this together as a diagram like this. So the first reciprocity map is defined on all the adelic points. The second reciprocity map is defined on the kernel of the first reciprocity map. The third reciprocity map is defined on the kernel of the previous two. Goes, progresses in this direction. What are the targets of this reciprocity? Well, I'll just give you a very quick description. What you do is you take this nth level of the filtration on the top of, on the profile fundamental group of X, and then you take this, uh, I guess you call this the Tate dual or something, and consider Galois cohomology of the Galois group of f bar over f with coefficients in this group, and then take the dual again, country again, dual. If you do that, you get a profinite group. Sorry? Ah, sorry. This is the group of m roots of unity. But uh, it, uh, I denote it by mu m to denote that it has a Galois action. Everything inside has a Galois action. So that you take this Galois cohomology with coefficients in this group. Then take the comes to country again, do all of that. So you get a profile and code. This is the target of the nth reciprocity. So, for example, if x is just a GM, in that case, what <coughs> happens is that this target, script GN, is zero for n at least two. Yeah. Except for the first one, they're all zero. And this and the reciprocity map can be identified with the usual reciprocity map. But if uh, the top fundamental group is non-abelian, then uh, this will all in general be non-trivial. Now, it's natural to put as x sub infinity, yeah, the intersection of the kernels of all the reciprocity. If you define x sub infinity that way, then the non abelian reciprocity law says that in fact the global points are inside this x sub infinity. In other words, the global points are killed by all the reciprocity. So this is kind of a, a rather complicated sounding, but I think natural generalization of our thing. Except now we're doing it for a curve of higher genus rather than here. OK, so that's the more or less the whole theorem. I mean, I don't have that much more to say, but I thought I'd show you a few examples to illustrate what you get out of this theorem. Um, well, 
So here's a very brief static remark. The reciprocity often by itself often implies the finiteness of the global point. That is to say, these are all different versions of the theorem of Hawking, often followed automatically from the reciprocity. Not always, because somehow I uh, still need to struggle with Galois cohomology in general. But situations where Galois cohomology can be more or less understood, you often get finiteness of the points from the reciprocity. Well, for example, for these generalized Fermat equations, you get finiteness of points just as a consequence of the reciprocity. Um, but that's somehow not the main focus of what I've been thinking about. Instead, you see, Rather, I would like to use this reciprocity law to compute points. That's the main motivation. So just the finiteness by itself isn't that interesting, but rather what concrete one can get out of this is what I've been focusing on. So I'm going to state a conjecture here that in some sense states that the points can be computed. <laughs> so well, how does this conjecture go? Well, in order to do that, it's inconvenient to use all the adelic points. Instead, I'm going to project it to one of the non-Archimedean components, the V adic component of the adelic component, V. Then denote by X, F, V sub N, simply the projection of the nth level filtration on the adelic. So this way, you get a, a filtration of the V adic points as well. So X, F, V sub 1, X, V sub 2, and so forth. And X, these will all contain the infinity level filtration on the viadic points as well, right? Intersecting with all the previous things. And the previous reciprocity law says that this guy will contain also the global points, which can be viewed as simply sitting inside the viadic points of the world. So here, because this is just a single non Archimedean field, there are more analytic techniques available. So here's a conjecture. So let's let x be a smooth projective curve of genus at least. So, and here, I can only make the confident way to make the conjecture when f equals q. So I restrict it to the case over q. Then for any prime of good reduction, in fact, this infinite level of the filtration should be equal to the q, just to the q rational point. Um, so there's a, uh, I'm not going to describe this, but this is, um, um, I'm not going to say any detail about this, but this conjecture is essentially this non-abelian analog <coughs> of the finiteness of the tetra private group for this Of course, the idea is that somehow this thing here should be computable, allowing us to compute the rational point, provided this conjecture is true. Uh, and the general idea to sketch very briefly is that whenever we have a Galois cohomology class, uh, here I'm being very sloppy. You need various restricted ramification and so forth to make these statements precise. But roughly speaking, if you have a Galois cohomology class with coefficients in one of these dual modules, then uh, what you do is by comp this kind, this class can be regarded as a function on this Galois cohomology, so that if you compose it with the reciprocity law, you get a function on the adels that kill the rational point. You can do, and if you can compute the projection to the p-adic points in some suitable way, that is to say, you have to take this abstract reciprocity law, take one of these functions, and be able to compute this function in some concrete way by an explicit reciprocity law, and then get out of that Piadic analytic function for zero set cut out this nth level of the filtration. And sometimes this can be done, but this is a very difficult problem in general that I'm still struggling with. But nevertheless, there are, here are some examples in, in short time, time. Unfortunately, the examples I can easily show you today are affine versions rather than the compact versions, but I'm going to do that anyway because that's really interesting. So when you're trying to do this for affine curves rather than compact curves, you have to replace all the rational points by integral points. And then the story goes through in exactly the same way. So here are some examples. Suppose you take x to be p1 minus 3 points. This is sort of the first hyperbolic curve. People have done a lot about concerning fundamental growth. In this case, of course, 
the global integral point is just empty. Yeah? So this, is, this isn't a case where we're actually interested in computing integral points, but at least as a test case for the conjecture, it's interesting to look at this case. Uh, here, if you compute the first non-trivial level of the filtration, the second level of the filtration, on the periodic points of P1 minus 3 points, what you get is you just get those points where the log is 0 and log 1 minus z is 0. This is the second level of the filtration. So this is quite straightforward consequence of a little bit of periodic Hodge theory. Yes. Now, uh, so of course, so the statement is that the empty set is, of course, contained inside here. And this isn't quite always empty, but sometimes it's empty already, you see, because uh, uh, if you look at this common zero set, z has to be either a sixth root of unity or the inverse of a sixth root of unity. So for example, if p is 3 or congruent to 2 mod 3, then in fact, the second level of the filtration is already empty, so that the conjecture is true at level 2 those p's. Now, when p is 1 mod 3, this actually is not, uh, this, uh, uh, the periodic points of p or minus 3 points actually does contain a 6 root of unity, so this isn't quite empty yet, so you have to go to a higher level to see if the, to verify the conjecture. So, but then, if you want to compute the one higher level of the filtration, what you find is the common zero set of log z, log 1 minus z, and this so-called periodic dialogue function. That's what you get as the next level of the filtration. I'm not telling you where any of these formulas come from. Yeah. I'll just, I'm just saying vaguely, as I said before, they all come from uh, periodic Hodge theory. So in this case, to check whether the conjecture is true, all you have to check is whether this dialogue vanishes at the sixth root of unity or not. Right? And I've been told by many experts that this should not vanish ever. <laughs> yeah. But it seems to be very hard to prove a statement of this. So maybe somebody here can prove it. But I, I haven't been able to say anything of this. But it seems to be conjectured to be true by people working on periodic regulators. But numerically, we've checked this for at least a small range of p. And I don't know anything about what kind of computations are actually involved, but I'm just citing my collaborators. But they tell me that actually this computation gets very laborious as p increases, but we haven't done more than a small range of p checking this. But so far, the conjecture appears to be numerically true for a large number of p, well, or a small number of p. So here's another example. So let's take x to be a semi -stable, the complement of the origin inside a semi-stable elliptical. And here, to make things simple, I'm going to take e to be of rank 0. And the p part of the Teichoff-Ravich group should be finite. So here, we get some periodic analytic functions by taking the periodic log. And in that case, in this case, as, as for the p1 minus 3 point, if you compute the second level of the filtration given by the reciprocity law, it again turns out to be just those points where the log is 0. So this is just the tor periodic torsion of the elliptical minus the origin. Now for small p, it often happens frequently that the local torsion is equal to the global quotient, in which case, in fact, the global integral point will become equal to this uh, second level of the filtration. But of course, this fails as p grows. So you have to now look, look one further down in the filtration. For that, we need one other function, this, p, this elliptic of, of version of the elliptic time of volume. It's an iterated integral. And we need a little bit more notation that I'm not going to bother you with you too much right now because I'm out of time. So we let s be the set of primes of bad reduction. And then for each prime of bad reduction, and Sabel denotes the order of the discriminant. And I get a set of numbers for each L, the handle W sub L, which end up being a kind of possible set of values for some periodic height. But anyway. Then, once you choose a set of numbers, W sub L, for each prime of bad reduction, then I'll just denote by W with this norm symbol around it, the sum of all the W Ls. So here's a theorem. Suppose E has rank 0, suppose that all the previous hypotheses are satisfied, that is. In that case, 
the third level of the filtration given by the reciprocity law is computed like this. It's a union of zero sets of periodic analytic functions where psi w uh, consists of those periodic points where the log is zero and the dialog of z is equal to the norm of w. You take the union of all of, of, of those values for all w and that's the third level of the filtration. Ah, so of course, the integral points are contained inside here, but it, uh, the latter in general could be made up of, potentially be made up of a large number of sets of psi w, so it could be much larger. So one needs to check what the discrepancy actually is. But by the way, the fact that the integral points are contained inside here is already a fairly interesting non explicit non-abelian reciprocity law. Which is not so obvious at all from a classical point of view. So um, for example, we checked it for this curve that where you can there are separate techniques to find completely the integral points on this curve, and this is a com complete set of integral points. And in that case, uh, we first checked that, in fact, this exactly equal, is equal to the third level of the filtration. If this case <coughs> is relatively easy because the Tamagawa number ends up being 1 at all p. So in that case, well, the equation simplifies, and it's easy to check this equality for at least this range of p's. Um, and so far, so to put it simply, so far we found, with our assumptions, that the global integral point is equal to the third level of the filtration for all the semi-stable elliptic curves and primes that we've tested so far. So for example, for prime p equals 5 and 256 semi-stable elliptic curves of rank 0, we've checked it numerically with the theorem. But here's a list of uh, from Cremona's table. So for, for example, for this curve, there's actually a large number of this psi w, 384 of them. Each of them could potentially contain some points contradicting the conjecture. But uh, so this is the curve. And uh, we, we checked all the 384 of the psi w and figured out, in fact, eventually compute that, that, that they're all empty except four that contain these integral points. So that was actually a very pleasant computation to do. So this is the flavor of the general example that one hopes to generalize substantially further through better techniques for coming up with these explicit responses. Now, I had a number of other things to say, in particular more examples in comparison with the Langland reciprocity, but I'll skip all that because we're out of time. And just mention briefly that somehow I tricked you and changed the topics in the middle. <laughs> I, I said that we were mostly interested in arithmetic field. Then we turned it into a question of studying equations, right? Well, you see, uh, there is a point of view whereby the studying the equations itself is the study of the field. And I rather like this point of view a great deal these days. So in particular, we can view the non-abelian reciprocity law that I stated as simply being <coughs> really a reciprocity law for the field F with coefficients in the curve X. Here, yeah, this is we're just changing the coefficient for the reciprocity law, generalizing the usual coefficient gm that goes into the abelian. So here, x really is a tool in some sense. We can view x as being a tool for studying f. It just allows us to formulate different reciprocity laws that give us information for x. This is a point of view I like very much these days, and that I really learned a lot. <laughs> this kind of general philosophy of study strongly influenced on the video. I just mentioned that and finish for today. Thank you very much. So are there any questions or comments? Mm -hmm. Your conjecture. Right, right. Mm -hmm. um, you dissected the model. Right. The calculations you showed it was level two or level three and it's that's right. That's right, yeah. Uh, yeah, it has to stabilize, essentially. That, uh, provided some other standard conjecture that I can't prove in general is true, what happens is that, uh, that as soon as that inclusion is proper, is a proper inclusion, that x qp sub n is actually finite. So there's no choice about this matter. So 
uh, that's why I'm reasonably confident about the conjecture. The fact that the inclusion is eventually proper is supported by some theorems, some numerical evidence, and so many standard conjectures of, from the theory of motives that it's hard not to believe. But as soon as it, the inclusion is proper, it's finite. So then, uh, after that, it's always an inclusion of finite tests as you go down the levels, right? So the general idea is that nothing can keep remaining in, in this sequence of non-decreasing sequence of finite tests unless it has a very good reason to remain there, which is it's actually a global relation. Any other questions? One big and one, one big one. The first question is, uh, you mentioned that the uh, uh, no abelian responsibility map uh, can be view, should be viewed as a, a sort of uh, uh, tangential, uh, you know, sort of base point at the creature. That's the explanation of this. So oh, no. I, I think what I said was, uh, uh, right, let's go back to the. So I said that. Ah, so no, <laughs> what I said is that the reciprocity map being equal to the base point of this target should be a defining equation for XF. So remember, the abelian reciprocity says, well, says that GMF is in the kernel of the reciprocity map, right? So the kernel, I'm just replacing the kernel at, uh, by, by the statement that the reciprocity map hits the base point. Sorry, yeah. kind of that's right. I just meant the kernel. Yeah. Another question is related to your joint work with Schiff and others mm -hmm. the, on the, P, the integer points. So right, right. P of my three points. Right, right. Yeah. And then the, the, the third filtration is involved with the three right. points. Right, we go forward again. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, with di dialogalism. That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but why does the dialogalism of 1 minus z doesn't happen? Oh, why does? Because it has, should have some symmetry. Ah, so, the, the, that's a very good point. That, that's because I simplify it slightly. Yeah, ah. That's right. So, yeah, well, I lied so much. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, yeah, for in, um, the dialogarism of 1 minus z should also appear if you use the full and important fundamental group. But actually, I used the simplified version, this quotient of the lean that only takes into what, what one side into account. You're, you're right, actually. So that should actually improve this picture as well. But I, I was working with the simplified one. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. So let's answer.